Hello guys, this is Tracer83 and welcome to my first video on long range rifle shooting and external ballistics. In this video I'm going to talk about spin drift, also known as the Magnus effect, what it is and whether or not you should account for it. Something I see brought up occasionally in the forums and here on YouTube is whether or not spin drift is something to worry about. And uh, an example is uh, sometimes I'll see a new thread posted on a forum where usually a new shooter, I think, will ask the question, hey, spin drift, is it something worth, uh, worth my time? Is it something I should factor into my firing solution and my windage call? Sometimes the response is, hey, you know, spin drift is so small and so seemingly insignificant that you should worry about other things. Wind, for example, is constantly changing and it's something that's gonna have a much bigger effect on the flight path of your bullet. Therefore, you shouldn't really worry about it. Now, I'm gonna argue that you should always consider it. The question though is, when should you start to apply it? At medium range? At short range even? or perhaps only at extended extreme range. Well, that's something we'll talk about in this video. As a bullet exits the muzzle of a gun, it does so with a tendency to want to stay parallel to the line of departure. And the effect of this is a slightly upward angle to the bullet. In other words, the nose is pointed slightly up. Small aerodynamic forces are pushing back on the bullet. And this combined with its spin, which is in most rifles to the right, causes the nose to get diverted over to the right as it overcomes resistance. This is called the yaw of repose. Taken together, these two effects essentially cause the bullet to skid through the air, which imparts a rightward deflection on the bullet as it attempts to remain stable. That's about all I'm gonna say about what spin drift actually is because I'm gonna post a few links down in the description box below to a couple of articles and also to a couple of good videos on the subject, the primary one being by Taborosaurus Rex. Before we get into the details, I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent and tell you a story. When I'm not shooting my rifles, I'm usually out at practical pistol matches, so USPSA and IDPA. Well, a couple months ago, there was a, a local match here in El Paso with a gentleman running the match who only shows up periodically because of work. After the match, we went back to the clubhouse and had lunch, and the gentleman sits down with me and says, hey, you mind if, I, mind if I sit and chat with you while I'm tallying up the scores? I said, no problem. While we were talking, I made mention that I felt a little rusty on my pistol shooting because for a year and a half before that, I'd been focused mostly on my rifle shooting. He says, oh, really? I'm into long range rifle shooting too. We started to talk about equipment, uh, the rifles that we shoot, some about reloading, and just kind of ballistics in general. It sort of went in that direction. I then made mention that I use a ballistics app on my iPhone when I'm at the range, just doing casual shooting. It's Ballistics AE, which you can purchase from the App Store for a few bucks. And he says, oh really, I wonder if that uses my calculator. And I said, uh, I don't think so, probably not. It's JBM Ballistics. And he says, yeah, that's me. JBM Ballistics is my calculator. That's me. JBM is me. And I said, huh, son of a gun. And then he started asking me about the app itself, what I thought about it. Uh, are there any improvements that I would make to it, which I couldn't think of any. But we started talking about spin drift because he has a separate calculator for spin drift. And first I asked him, well, how can you have a spin drift calculator, which is just part of the overall program, listed separate. So in other words, he's got the base program that you can use or you can go in and use the one that includes spin drift. And just as a, I don't know, an interesting point, he says, well, a lot of guys, they're reluctant to use something new. They don't want to complicate things. So they just go in and use the old one. After that, he asked me about spin drift itself. And he asked me if it was something that I really observe in my shooting. And if it's something that I pay attention to. And I said, well, first of all, in rifle shooting, it's hard, if not impossible, to actually observe it because I think as Brian Litt says in one of his books or in one of his DVDs, in order to really test for spin drift, you'd have to have a climate controlled extended range indoor range that uh, isolates everything and gets rid of the wind component. So I said, well, in my rifle shooting, I don't see it directly, but it is important to me. And then I made mention of my day job.
Oh yeah. There's Sir, are you aware that he's plotting on uh, sacrificing you to the artillery guns? Yeah. They would solve all of our maintenance problems. I want to know. They require a ginger. Just I, tell me. I didn't make the rules. <laughs> Alright? As you just saw, when I'm not making YouTube videos, I work as a field artilleryman. And the ranges at which we shoot, even the closer ranges, would usually be considered well outside the maximum effective range of most rifles. That being said, spin drift is absolutely something that we have to account for because when we're shooting five kilometers, 10, 15 and beyond, we could have spin drift as much as 50, 100, or even 150 mils. And that's not fractions of a mil, that's actual mils. So just do the math. If you calculate that out to, let's say, 10 kilometers, that's where your target's gonna be, and you've got, we'll say, only 50 mils of spin drift. Well, at 10 kilometers, 50 mils is 500 meters. And I bring this up just to demonstrate that spin drift absolutely is a thing. It's something that does occur, and it's something that will greatly affect your firing solution at extended range. The question though is, how far out do you need to start thinking about it? How close in should you start thinking about it? Backing up to the original conversation that I was having with this gentleman as to whether or not I pay attention to spin drift, I said, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm in the field artillery, and we deal with it all the time because it's, it's very pronounced. With my rifle, it's less pronounced. But I try to pay attention to it at every opportunity because I wanna do everything I can to eliminate all uncertainty with the wind. And what I have found in my shooting in my limited amount of time uh, paying attention to this is it helps me make sense of the wind. If I am off on my wind call, then when I come back to it and I take a second look at it, but I've got all my other lateral factors accounted for, then the adjustment that I have to make makes a lot more sense. So how much of an effect are we really talking about with spin drift at these different ranges? You know, I've been dancing around the question as to when do I start to factor in spin drift? Well, if I've got the time, I'll dial it in to my scope uh, because I'll usually dial spin and Coriolis directly into the optic. I'll do that 300 meters, 400 meters. Um, and then by the time I get to 500 meters, I'm definitely dialing it because at 300 meters, my spin drift on the 175 grain Sierra Match King that I shoot through a one in 12 twist barrel has about 0 0.08 mils of deflection on it, which is closer to 0.1 mils than not. Once you get out to 500 meters with my current conditions, the spin is about 0.15 mils, which translates to just under two inches. 0.15 mils at 500 meters may or may not be enough to miss a medium-sized target. You'd have to be right on the edge one way or the other. But more so than that, it could mean the difference between a clean kill on a game animal or missing the vitals and just wounding the animal. If I'm shooting at smaller targets, then you know, as I go down in size, that is definitely a bigger chance of me missing. Now what this does for me is give me a better sense of security and confidence in my wind call. Once you get out to a thousand yards or 915-ish meters, we'll just use that as an example. Spin drift for a 308 bullet is right around the order of 0.3 mils. At 1,000 yards, that is nine inches. Definitely enough to miss a target, and more so than that, to make complete nonsense of your wind call if you're not accounting for it. Even if spin drift only affected the flight path of your bullet a minuscule amount, even at long range, 
I would still argue that in your day-to-day -day practice that you still account for it. Now, as we just saw, it's quite a bit more than that, but even if it were small, I would say still account for it because learning to read the wind is very difficult. It's something that I'm still learning. It's something that I'll continue to learn as long as I have a rifle. Let's talk about practicality for a second. The decision to think about spin drift at ranges of, I'd say, between three and 500 meters is gonna depend on what you're trying to do. It just so happens that I have my spin adjustments more or less memorized for my current area and the conditions that I'm shooting in. But let's say you don't have them memorized and you're just making hasty shots and kind of trying to take a swag at the wind. At shorter ranges, spin will have less effect, but also wind itself is gonna have less effect. If time is of the essence and you're not even formally calculating your wind holds, you'll probably make hits on target with a best guess. And that's not thinking about spin. That's not really even going into detail with the wind as a whole or your windage as a whole. For example, here's me shooting at some eight inch plates at 300 meters with a wind sort of bouncing around between zero and five miles an hour. All I'm doing here is holding on the right edge of the plate and seeing where that gets me. So that was 300 meters. At 500, I might be able to get away with this, but I'm not gonna have any kind of predictability in my shots. I might hit the edge of the target, I might hit dead center. It just depends, partly depends on luck. If you're trying to practice wind reading and or shoot with precision at these distances, then you're gonna need to do three things. You're gonna have to formally calculate your wind, continually refine your wind calls, and account for spin. Beyond those ranges, there's no question. You absolutely have to give your wind call due diligence. Continue to watch the wind and factor everything else into it. Spin and to a lesser extent, Coriolis. Here's a good example of what I'm trying to talk about. This is me getting ready for my first shot of the day, actually my first shot of a few months at a plate at a thousand yards. I calculated for about a six mile an hour steady wind from left to right. I dialed in my spin, dialed in my Coriolis. They both kind of added together to come out to just a tad over 0.3 mils. While I was lining my shot up and also I think fumbling around with the camera, the wind died down to almost nothing and I didn't catch it. I wasn't really paying attention. So my first shot was a meter, meter and a half off the left side of the target. At this point, the wind started to boil with just an occasional tip over one direction or another. It was being really capricious. For my next shot, I decided to kind of do a modified Horus technique where I just moved my reticle over from the point of impact to where uh, my target actually is. And uh, I didn't really take good note of where the splash on the first round was, so I was sort of guessing. With that, I lined my crosshair up along, I think, the left edge of the plate, maybe the left third of the plate. Send another shot. This one was just off the left side of the plate. By this point, the mirage turned into a pretty steady boil and wind going left to right and right to left, depending on where in the bullet's flight path it was. Even though I missed my first couple shots, the second one was just kind of a hasty makeup. On the third shot, I had confidence that my wind value was null. This all made sense to me, and it's because I had already dialed nine inches of deflection onto my scope. And I think this just goes to show that even though my wind call, my initial one wasn't perfect, that eliminating every bit of uncertainty from your wind call can really help you tie things together. 
In conclusion, guys, and this I think is the takeaway, if you're working on your wind reading abilities and trying to be as precise as you can be, pay attention to spin. It'll make your observations of what's going on downrange all the more clear and informative. You'll get real feedback from what you're observing. And finally, it has the potential to make you a more knowledgeable, well-rounded precision shooter at any distance. So that's about it, guys. Thanks for watching, as always. I hope you found this video informative or at least entertaining. Take a minute to click that subscribe button, like, and share with your friends. And until next time, keep your eye on that crosshair.